So big oil is spending literally billions of dollars to gaslight governments and the public into believing we can go on burning fossil fuels and capture the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere through this process of carbon capture and utilization and sequestration. And they are trying to make us believe that we can stop the temperature rising through CCUS. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. We have a special guest with us tonight, but before we get started, remember to hit that like button, like and subscribe, and share this video with a friend. This topic tonight is a big one. The carbon clock is ticking, and our special guest is Denny Taylor. Denny is a distinguished alumna of Columbia University. She's also co-founder and CEO of Garn Press a philanthropic press. Denny is currently working on a book on climate mitigation net zero, CCS. And Denny, I'm really, really so glad that you're joining us tonight. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I'm pretty sure you have some thoughts on this, and it's just been the latest buzz, is this whole issue of don't worry about the carbon in the atmosphere. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to capture it, we're going to store it, and we're going to use it. And it's going to be a benefit of, to society. And as a matter of fact, it's going to be absolutely safe. And this is referred to as CCUS. And I would really love to know your thoughts on uh, this carbon capture use and storage phase that we're going through. Well, thank you. I, and it's a pleasure to be here. It was very nice of everyone to invite me. The report I've just been working on is um, called The Carbon Clock is Ticking. And I didn't know anything about the idea of carbon capture utilization and storage until um, I really got into this research. It's something that most of us have very little understanding of. It's actually taken about a year of my life, about 12 hours a day, trying to pull this whole thing together. But it's fascinating and it's also very troubling, I think is a, good, is a good word for it. It's big oil's second big lie. The first big lie is that the denial of climate change. 40 years of um, lobbying, whether it's Congress, uh, around, actually around the world, lobbying um, pu the public as well, to make us all believe that this whole idea of climate change is, is essentially just a lie. So the denial of climate uh, change has led them into this new phase where they're saying, okay, the climate is changing, but we can fix it. So big oil is saying, we don't have to stop uh, pumping oil. You do not have to take your foot off the gas. We can fix this with carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage. So what I'm going to try and do is to um, explain a little bit about carbon capture. It is not straightforward. So big oil is spending literally billions of dollars to gaslight governments and the public into believing we can go on burning fossil fuels and capture the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere through this process of carbon capture and utilization and sequestration. And they are trying to make us believe that we can stop the temperature rising through CCUS. The science is unequivocal. It is not possible to develop this technology in time at scale without risks to communities, and it will cost trillions in public money. 
the bottom line is that for children and young people to survive, we must end our use of fossil fuels and we must do it fast. So that's the short piece on it. And I'm, I'm going to share a few notes on, on carbon capture so that you will have a really good idea um, when you hear the term, when you're being told that this is a good idea. Um, many in Congress, of course, are supporting it, that um, you'll have a foundation on which to make your own decisions. And I can share these notes with your organization. So the biggest problem is that the US, and, and this, this is global as well, carbon capture cannot be built at scale fast enough to make it have a, a significant impact on CO2 emissions uh, from power generation and industrial sectors which generate 50% of the CO2 emissions. And even the most optimistic projections of the fossil fuel industry in carbon capture and storage, it's very clear that um, it will take until 2045 before it has any kind of significant impact. We do not have that time. Even um, the 500 million tons a year of CC, uh, CCUS that, uh, that they would be able to capture, it's going to cost the, in, and I'm going to talk America, you'll have to forgive me, taxpayers are going to be paying 55 billion per year in Q45 tax credits. So the industry is saying, we can take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, we can stick it in the ground, but we'll need tax money to do that. And the amount of tax money is astronomical. Congress already has bills going through uh, to provide big oil with the tax breaks they need to put this into uh, service. So since the locations, and this is really critical, since the locations of power generation and industrial plants in the US are far removed from potential deep well CO2 sequestration locations nationwide, CO2 pipeline system will be required. And Princeton University has done a study supported by Exxon that uh, has actually mapped out, you can go to their site and you can see 68,000 miles of piping that is going to crisscross the country. Think of the time, think of the money to transport CO2. That's a serious problem. Here is the critical part and is that we're told it's safe. So February 2021, 20, you, you can do a search for um, Satasha and the gas pipe explosion. And you will find information about a rupture of one of these gas uh, pipes that took place in Satasha, Mississippi, caused a total evacuation of over 300 residents with almost 60 people hospitalized. And the national uh, news has never picked it up. And the reports that are supposed to have been written we have not been able to locate. We've made a number of attempts to get the official documentation that should be there, and it's not available at this time. This incident shows that the minimum distance for any CO2 pipeline from a residential area should be one mile to 1.5 miles, a criteria that is not met by the CO2 pipelines in operation at this time or planned under construction. The main point of this is that, and we've been writing about it in quite a lot of depth, is that the story that Big Oil is telling, Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, about carbon capture is very much slanted towards keeping the big oil in business and pumping oil and not moving away to cleaner energy sources. I put together two documents that you can make available. 
um, that are up to this moment. So they were published on May 18th, 2022. Why CCUS is important. One of the things that, that is said in this document is that carbon capture helps reduce the carbon intensity of industrial operations and is a critical component. This is the gaslighting is a critical component of meeting the global net zero ambitions of the Paris Agreement. So anyone in the public, you're sitting down and, and, and watching the news, I've heard reports on this on the news, immediately thinks, okay, we need this stuff, it's critical. Uh, it's not critical. Renewable energy investments are, and that's where we should be putting all of our time, effort, ingenuity, and we need to be doing it fast. Um, there's a sleight of hand with the intergovernmental panel. The thing that one of these two documents that I found two days ago asks if carbon capture sounds good, it says, but is it safe? And the thing that is so extraordinary about this document, it talks about carbonated drinks because you use CO2, but you're not gonna use it from CO2 that has been used um, in um, heavy industry because it's impure. So it has nothing to do with um, carbonated drinks. You cannot add um, CO2 to, uh, to beer or Coca-Cola from this process. But if you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, carbonated drinks, that's good, beer, soda, and then later on in this document, it talks about clothes and diamonds. You cannot make diamonds from the capture of carbon and sequestration. They say, yes, is, is the short answer is yes, uh, it's safe. And um, I'm going to say very clearly, no, it's not safe. And as far as it being stored safely, we need to look at Satasha. There are several other ruptures that need to be looked at. As far as this massive piping is concerned, the piping is going to go into areas where people are living. Um, and so safe storage is a problem. The transportation, as I was just saying, is a problem. The idea of safe reuse, when they're talking about things like clothes and, and diamonds has makes no sense whatsoever. And in my notes, I wrote this is the, that section is total nonsense, which probably is a little um, strong. But the other part of this is that the examples that they're giving of plants that carbon capture has been successful. We've now deconstructed the three or four plants that have been constructed and each one of them has been a failure is not in use and that includes the one that is used by Chevron uh, in um, Australia. So that's carbon capture in a nutshell, or I hope anyway, I hope it made sense. It's a lot of stuff to try to uh, cover. There's a much longer explanation in the report that's actually on my website if anyone is interested in looking at it. Well, we'll certainly direct the viewers um, in the description to your website. And I think also it's worth um, linking the article of Chevron. I did also read that article, thanks to you, Denny. And I, I noticed, you know, I'm a big fan of seltzer. I'm not going to lie. And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, carbon is carbon. Um, so you see how dastardly it is. It is absolutely terrible. And the diversion of funds from clean energy to sustain their destruction of the planet and for the taxpayers to fund it is just hideous. And the fact that it took you who are, you're so knowledgeable and it took you so long to do research on this and so many days and days and days and hours, you said a year, they know that the regular person just can't do that and are not going to understand. And that's what they've relied on this whole time. And that's how they've been able to, um, to fool people that, that uh, well, gasoline has nothing to do with climate change. Um, it's, it's, it's really frightening. 
And the issue with uh, Satarsha, I think we should, we'll also link um, an article or two to yeah. that description. That's frightening. It's absolutely frightening that um, there are these catastrophes that we don't even know anything about. It, may I just add one, one thing, which is that what has really um, surprised me, surprised us as we've been working on, on this uh, research is that Princeton and Imperial College London and many other universities are uh, supported by big oil and are involved in research that has to do with carbon capture and also the Biden administration, Jennifer Granholm and Jennifer Wilcox, um, the Secretary of Energy and one of her contemporaries are working with um, big oil and we have them in, in videos talking uh, about some of the work that is going on, presenting it as um, successful. When you go to the site and you look at what is happening, you find that the circumstances are very troubling. And in fact, uh, the, the carbon capture units um, it, uh, have been shut down. Wow, it's, it's, it's truly frightening. Um, there's a lot to take in there. And I'm wondering, Paul, Peter, do either of you, I'm certain that you have questions or thoughts on what Denny shared with us so far? Yes, uh, I'll step in here, uh, Paul. So um, thank you very much, um, Denny. Um, the idea of um, piping CO2 um, at the surface, um, you're, you're just under the surface is actually quite frightening because um, air is mostly nitrogen, which is um, the molecular weight of nitrogen is 30. H2O is in the air, its molecular weight is 18, oxygen, 32. Well, CO2, carbon is 12, oxygen is 16 each. So the molecular weight of CO2 is 44, which is heavier than any of the other components. So the CO2 is denser than, than anything else. So if there's a, you know, that CO2 pipe rupture that you were talking about, that CO2 will just hug the ground. It'll find the, the valleys, the lower areas of the ground, and it will go and asphyxiate. It'll displace the oxygen and the nitrogen, any other components in that region, and it will just asphyxiate um, any living um, creature in, in that area. And we know in some African regions, CO2 has bubbled up from the depths of the um, lakes, you know, depending on the um, hydrology of these lake systems, and that CO2 gets onto the shorelines and it's completely killed villages along the shorelines, plus uh, livestock, any animals there for, for long distances around. And, and, you know, people that go to that area after that event, they wonder everything's dead, but why, what killed it? Because there's no visible signs on the, on the bodies of, of, the, of the livestock or the people. So the idea of piping CO2 near the surface um, is absolutely crazy. Um, any CO2 that's sequestered you know, to be done safely, it needs to be pumped deep under the ground where um, the pressure and temperatures can liquefy it, for example, or people have talked about pumping it to the, the ocean floor where it would be liquefied. Um, it needs to be stored in the Earth's system for, you know, at least a thousand years to be considered by any means uh, safe. And that's just not part of the uh, big oil protocol. And, um, you know, it's hard for a leopard to change its spots. It, it can't. So any of these so-called great ideas coming from big oil, we need to really be skeptical of. I mean, one of the ones from a few years ago was the idea to use natural gas as a bridge fuel. Um, and this was really pushed by the oil companies. And as a result, uh, fracking companies sprang up and we had fracking wells all over in, in different regions and it's methane. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas and leak rates more than a few percent mean that um, natural gas or methane um, is as bad for the climate as uh, coal, for example. And another thing, apart from the carbon capture and storage or CCUS, is the oil industry is also pushing now for going to a hydrogen economy. Um, to use hydrogen as a storage uh, mechanism and 
again, like I said, anytime these things are suggested by large oil companies, there's, you know, just look at their track record. They're in it for themselves. They're in it for the bottom line and for the dollars. They don't worry too much about, about the, the uh, you know, people, how it will affect people. Now, I know a lot of your work um, is on, you know, saving the planet for the kids and young people. And I love the book, The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, because he talks about sort of the discount rate. Nicholas Stern did like how how do we value a human life in the future and the way we're acting um, you can speak more on this is there is no value to human life in the future we're not valuing um, any kids or any human lives in the future at all and um, there's no real government agencies um, that are that are valuing kids and we can look at other policies in the U.S. we can look at the massacres in schools of kids Right. And it seems that kids' lives are just, they're not valued. And I like one of the analogies in the book um, is that, uh, you know, it's like you can have a professional hockey team and they're playing against a team of three year olds. And the hockey team, the National Hockey League team represents people in the present, and the three year old kids playing represent, you know, the future. And there's no contest. Like, like it's a massacre, it's a slaughter. So if nobody's looking out for, the, um, for young people, then um, that's really a reflection of, of how we've gone wrong in our society because the, the value of a society, people have said, is how you treat your, your weakest, most vulnerable people. We're failing on all these measures. So, so I don't know, um, can you maybe elaborate on, on some of those things? President Zelensky said a few days ago, uh, how do you compensate for the life of the child? I don't think anyone has an answer for that. We don't have an answer in the present. We don't have, we certainly are not thinking to the future. That one of the things that um, I think is important and I've no idea how to uh, expand upon it. Uh, my doctoral research 40 odd years ago focused on families and literacy and continued doing research with families who are living in um, pretty critical circumstances um, following catastrophic events. But the research itself took off and is now, um, there are family literacy programs in 140 UN uh, member states. Many of those programs are focusing on problems within the community. So they're using literacy, not some are teaching reading and writing, but many of them are using literacy to approach problems that communities have. And I keep thinking that if this idea could, have, could go around the world without an enormous amount of help, although of course the UN picked it up, I stopped searching after 140 UN member states, so it could be more. But ideas going through communities and what we need is for families to make the commitment to do whatever they can for their children. And the only way they can do that is if we can cut through all of the propaganda. Um, it's a tall order. But, but I do think that there are examples of uh, situations where ideas have, have passed from one group of people to another. Because when we finally get down to it, the primary organizing um, principle for all of human societies is the family. And somehow or other, we have to get to a point where families stand up to their children and say, you know, I want my child to be here when he's 70. I don't want to him to move out because the, a billion people are going to be displaced in, in 2050. I think it's a matter of creating a new narrative. How we do that, especially, you know, uh, for individuals sitting in their, you know, little um, spaces doing research, it's very hard to imagine how that happens. The thing that's important is it's possible whether it's probable or not is another thing. We do have the mechanisms. We can't wait for governments. Governments are paid off. The American government is half of it, is probably three quarters of it, is receiving money from big oil. 
but how we cut through that narrative of big oil is really important because we have to get to a point where civil society says we've had enough. We're gonna take our foot off the gas pedal. And the Pew um, Research Organization has done, just done a study and I think it's something like 70% of people uh, in advanced economic countries have said they would change their lifestyle uh, to save the planet. Essentially what they're saying is, we'll change our lifestyle to save our children. Yeah, I, I mean, we're presently not placing any value on the lives of unborn children, you know, even a generation out really, not dealing with climate change and, you know, many other issues. It's like, we're just here for now and, and uh, <laughs> you know, party time now and uh, live for now and no thought or foresight on, on future generations. Yeah. I think it's important to hold on to the idea that we could do it. We have to keep trying. Yeah. I understand why people feel that it's hopeless and uh, they, they call them, I think, doomies. And Doomers, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I am not there. I will keep working. And we all have to keep working. We all have to pitch in. And one of the uh, things that I think is, is really helpful is the sustainable development goals that the, the UN uh, has developed. There's lots of reasons why it's not going very far through the UN that has a lot to do with private money in holding power with, within the UN. But the sustainable development goals, the idea that we need strong communities and uh, we need equity and the disparity between rich and poor needs to be much uh, less. Those goals for communities, I think are really important. There needs to be conversations. The way we are teaching children needs to change. They need to be problem solvers. We all do. We've all got to be problem solvers. No, I, I really appreciate what you had to say. And it's, it is very easy to become a doomer. I go back to what Noam Chomsky said, you know, optimism over despair. The system is there to help us feel despair, but we cannot give into it. We have to maintain a semblance of optimism. And I know this is something that you, Peter, subscribe to all the time. And I would love to hear what you have to say in regards to optimism, the youth, and what Denny's had to share with us tonight. Um, I'm optimistic. and. I greatly appreciate the fact that Denny has focused um, her uh, attention and research and writing um, with her reports and her book on carbon capture storage. I'm just very frustratingly making a second video on the IPCC Working Group 2 Impact Report. It's a terrifying report. Yeah. And the IPCC scientists have it all down there. In actual fact, they, I found that they have a, a frequently asked questions, an FAQ, um, which accompanies the Working Group 2 report. And one of the frequently asked questions is, if we continue on business as usual, what does that mean for our children? So this is amazing to see this in the IPCC assessment. Um, and that, um, their answer is absolutely horrific. I can't be optimistic about the future. Um, I, I just can't. Um, and I maintain my optimism in all the people and, you know, great people um, like a team here and Denny and many others um, who are, you know, dedicating their time, you know, to, to put this right. But I'm afraid that our children are going to inherit hell on earth. This is what the science says. We have all the numbers. How many times the heat waves are going to be increased? How much longer the heat waves are going to last? How many more floods we're going to get in flood prone regions and how widespread those floods will become? Um, how, the frequency of the drought and the intensity of droughts. We have it all, right? Well, we don't seem to be very good at making the connection that this is the world that we're leaving our children today. 
doesn't seem that we're making that connection very well. Um, just a comment on CCS. I, um, I recently, actually because of Denny's research, I, I remembered that um, the IPCC did a CCS special report. So I thought, I wonder when that was, you know? I was absolutely astounded. It was back in 2005. It was a big, big report. If you read it, the impression you get is that this is no problem. This is going to happen. We're going to start removing the CO2 from the atmosphere. Our governments are doing worse than nothing on this issue, which is a survival issue for all humanity. Um, they are pushing more and more and more fossil fuels, right? Um, the International Energy Agency told us just a few months ago that uh, last year was a new record for um, uh, fossil fuel CO2 emissions, a new record for the burning of coal. Absolutely incredible. So um, thinking uh, uh, about Denny's report here, why is it that governments have managed to, um, to get away with this to this extent for so long? I mean, the, they signed the UN Framework Climate Change Convention in 1992, and that convention said, the last paragraph of the preamble was, determined to safeguard the climate for, our for the future of our children. This is what it said. They've done completely the opposite. Um, so how come? Well, I think the big reason, and there's only one, I mean, you can mention corruption and lobbying, and that's all true, but they've only got one excuse. And that excuse is called CCS. There's no other rationale whatsoever for the governments to be pouring out, you know, um, more money, more subsidies into more fossil fuels. So... I used to call it a boondog. I used to call CCS a boondog, um, uh, but it's an absolutely deadly, planetary deadly deception. I'm afraid, and, and actually Denny's sort of inferred it already, um, the scientists, um, they don't seem to know where the line is between science and science fiction. Um, that's the kindest thing I can say. Uh, the scientific community, um, is supportive of this uh, science fiction delusion. And each IPCC report has more about CCS and more reliance on CCS. And yet, as Denny's explained to us, after all these years and all this money, nothing's happening, right? We're not removing any CO2 out of the atmosphere, no matter what the fossil fuel industry may say. Uh, we are not. So I think we've got to get scientists on, on, on science. Right. I think the other part of, of this is that while so much money and effort is going into uh, carbon capture, uh, that money could be going into alternate uh, energy sources. And so it's a double whammy in that all, if we put it all in, into uh, CO2 removal and keep oil flowing, we're not working on wind and solar and uh, other possibilities, all of which could be up and running within a time frame that would make a difference in uh, young people's lives and actually would not be any more expensive, although part of the of the this second big lie is that uh, it would be too expensive and it's not it's not possible to bring it to scale. Um, so that's that's a, a, a serious part of this as well really you know what's behind this the, the sort of delusion you remember um uh, when um donald trump became president of the united states one of the first things he did was um uh, make his secretary of state rex tillerson yes <laughs> um uh, the ceo for many many years of exxon right exxon the big climate denier and the big climate deceiver um and when he was questioned um uh, you know, he went to Congress and was questioned. He was asked about, you know, how seriously he took climate change. And he said, oh, oh yeah, 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 we understand climate change and we take it seriously. It's an engineering problem. Yeah. And that was that. 
went on to the next question, right? So uh, we are a society that sort of, you know, thinks we can fix anything, right? No matter how big it is, right? Um, so um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> you're triggering uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in, in me to, to recall back when Trump was elected and, you know, gets out of the um, climate accords, you know, um, in the first day of office, basically. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when he was elected, um, there were many people at the climate conference and it was like, you know, the, the, the atmosphere just became like a big funeral <laughs> you know, at the conference. You know, we know Trump is going to be president now. It was just, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's just cat been catastrophic for, for climate action. I mean, it's the problem, the, the whole pol political system, we've got a political party in the US that doesn't even believe it's occurring. I mean, it's just, you know, in this day and age, it's just, uh, you know, this craziness. I think it's important um, for uh, anyone listening to have a sense that they have agency and can, and can act. And there is so much that we can do in our everyday lives to to try both through um, our social groups, but also through the way that we're living. And I do think it's important that um, there is a focus on the local and what local communities can do. Um, what we can do in, I actually divested of my house and my, and my car. I've divested of a lot of things, um, but uh, the idea that, that we participate that we make sure that our communities are strong, that we try to do everything that we can to counter the, the, the craziness that we're confronted with every day. And uh, I think it's absolutely worth doing. In fact, going out of our way to try to um, help build stronger communities than we have in the, in the last few decades as I think it's become more and more complicated for us to do that. And the idea that talking to politicians, talking to our local representatives and thinking about um, what our community can do to lower the amount of, of CO2 that we are pumping out into the atmosphere. I think those things are worth doing because we don't know where they'll go. That's the thing that I hold on to is the fact that governments have picked up my research. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't working with any of these, these people, or these governments, but the research itself has gone places. And it's all about, about community and family and trying to make our local neighborhoods as strong as possible. And I think that's something that's important because it's so easy to, to become well, depressed, I suppose, is the, the word to, to, to feel that it's hopeless. And I don't think we can do that. We can't do that because of our children. We've got to try to, to, to focus on making it different and maybe we'll do it. I think that is a beautiful, beautiful place to end. And I, I really appreciate your ability to maintain optimism and that we can do it. And I want to invite uh, people in our audience to take to heart what Denny shared, you know, starting with the family, building strong families, building a strong local community, seeing what you can do in your community. And it really is true. It can be done. You can start small, um, maybe um, doing composting in your building or in your neighborhood. There's so many different things that, that, that we can do. And so I invite you all to, to take up that mantle and do it for the children, do it for the future. Who else will? So I wanna thank you all once again for joining us for another Climate Emergency Forum and we'll see you next time.